Hey, I'm Gordon Wettstein, Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Stanford University. My group works on computational imaging and displays, as well as neural scene representation, rendering, and generation. And what I'd like to do today is share with you some of our recent work on neural scene representation, rendering, and generation, because I believe these are uh, emerging techniques that uh, redefine what we understand computer graphics to be. Now, most of you have probably heard of neural radiance fields or NERFs, and they have really transformed uh, how we think about view interpolation problems over the last two years or so. So neural radiance fields take multiple photographs or images as input along with the camera poses, and they extract what we call a neural scene representation. So an optimizable, differentiable, oftentimes neural network parameterized representation of the scene that can be queried at new camera positions and create you know, really realistic interpolation results, but also depth maps without being directly supervised on the depth. These techniques have been very, you know, your research in these techniques has been very active and we can now generate results that look pretty much photorealistic. If you look closely, you know, you'll see a few artifacts here and there around depth uh, discontinuities perhaps, but you know, the, the quality of these techniques has become incredibly uh, amazing and uh, this, this has been uh, fantastic. So this is just a motivating example for uh, how to use neural scene representations for computer graphics applications, but these types of representations have a transformative impact in many different fields, ranging from robotics to autonomous driving, AR, VR, traditional computer vision, and also computer graphics. We can think about these as differentiable representations that are multimodal in nature because they don't just need to represent visual appearance, but they can represent all sorts of things like semantic understanding, uh, audio or other other aspects. And this is why people have become very interested in it. What I'd like to do in the following is talk a little bit about these types of scene representations because the representation is usually the backbone of uh, such a framework. Then talk about rendering uh, and how to combine that with these uh, neural scene representations. And then talk a little bit about generation because generation is really an aspect that you know is very difficult to do with traditional computer graphics techniques. Okay, so let's take a step back and think about how we represent signals in general. It's very convenient to just, you know, always think about how to represent signals in a discrete way. For example, images are typically represented by pixels. You know, shapes can be represented in many different ways, but one way is, uh, for example, a 3D point cloud. And audio signals can be represented as discretized waveforms that are sampled at a certain sampling rate. So these are all discrete representations that we have been using for the last few decades and that have dominated all fields of science and engineering. But continuous representations have gained popularity over the last little while, maybe starting in 2018 or so. And they don't seem to be supernatural because you know we think about the world as in a computer at least as being discretized, but the physical world is actually continuous and there are ways to represent scenes in a continuous fashion. And this is what we call a, a neural scene representation. For example, a, a simple one is a multi-layer perceptron or MLP uh, that is a neural network basically, which is trained to represent a 3D shape in this case. So such a network could be set up in a way that it takes as input the XYZ coordinate. So a 3D coordinate is the input to this network. Uh, we have a few fully connected layers, which makes it a multi-layer perceptron. And then the output is a quantity of interest. It could be the occupancy, which gives you, for example, one in, when you're inside the object and zero outside. It could be the sign distance function. Uh, so it could be like a, the distance to the closest surface. Um, and uh, that is a continuous representation because you can query it anywhere in space. Now, the most common way to set up an MLP is by uh, concatenating linear layers uh, with nonlinear activation functions. And the most popular nonlinear activation function for neural networks today is the rectified linear unit or ReLU. Now, this has been proposed in you know, a number of papers between 2018 and 2020. 
Uh, and it turns out that this works really well. You can represent a 3D shape by a ReLU MLP, but it turns out that as the scene grows in complexity, the ReLU MLP, at least at a manageable size, uh, doesn't have enough capacity to really represent this 3D scene in all its aspects. So, you know, you get a lot of artifacts and it doesn't look very good. Turns out that this is a common thing. Uh, if you use ReLU MLPs to represent images, 3D shapes, audio signals, or maybe you want to represent general fields uh, and potentially perform uh, computations on those, for example, uh, solve a partial differential equation on a field, you have to ensure that the gradients are also represented appropriately. It just turns out that these ReLU MLPs are not adequate to represent natural scenes. Now, one way of overcoming that uh, is uh, to use a different neural activa activation function, nonlinear activation function, and a simple activation function that we presented uh, back in 2020, which we called uh, basically a siren, a sinusoidal representation network, just used a sign as the activation function, adds enough capacity to a very small network to be able to represent 2D images, 3D shapes, complex 1D audio fields, and uh, even complex valued fields uh, with their gradient informations at such a high fidelity that you can even solve uh, partial differential equations on those. So this was a really interesting insight that you can use as a slightly different twist on these ReLU MLPs by simply replacing the nonlinear activation function with a periodic activation function and give these networks uh, theoretically in, in uh, infinite capacity to represent and overfit these signals at a very high quality. So for example, this is uh, these are results from our 2020 in Europe's paper. Uh, if you use a five layer uh, MLP with 256 uh, hidden units to represent the sine distance function of a 3D shape, the Thai statue here, and directly comparing uh, a ReLU activation functions on the left, with these uh, sinusoidal representation functions on the right, you can see that you get a lot more capacity, a lot more detail for the exact same number of parameters in this neural network. Uh, so that was a really interesting insight. It sort of helped make some of these uh, representation networks more practical. Uh, here's the ReLU MLP representing a room size scene, whereas here's a siren representing the exact same scene with the same number of parameters. We see that we can actually use these MLPs to represent fairly complex scenes very well. Now, how does this work in more detail? Hopefully that was a motivating example that uh, continuous representations are actually interesting. So there's a couple of different types of uh, neural scene representations that we can think about. Uh, and the first one, and this is the one that most people are thinking about right now, is what we call an implicit neural representation because it implicitly represents surface or some other quantity of interest, a field. This is also used by NERF, for example, in a slightly different fashion. But the basic idea is that we have a couple of fully connected layers, uh, potentially with positional encoding here in the input. Uh, and the, the input is the position, X, Y, Z, for example, goes to these fully connected layers. And we predict, for example, density and color. Density, in this case, is a is a good way to represent uh, natural scenes in 3D that can be, then be rendered, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, we can also encode the direction of the view array uh, to enable uh, radiance fields that are directionally variant, and that's really great. So many of you have probably seen these types of architectures. There's a block diagram of an MLP, basically representing a radiance field. And these are really interesting because they can be more memory efficient, especially for high dimensional signals. So think about the position as a 3D vector, the direction is a, you know, maybe in this case, a 2D uh, vector. So there's a five dimensional uh, function that maps 5D input to 4D output, one dimension for the density, three for the color. You know, if you were to represent this in a discrete grid, uh, you'd quickly run out of memory. So thinking about these, MLPs to encode a high dimensional lookup table, if you want, is a really great way to, uh, to represent such a high dimensional scene. However, it shouldn't be overlooked how inefficient this process actually is. Every time you want to query this function, you actually have to do a full feed forward pass through the entire network. So for every coordinate uh, 
that you want to evaluate this at at xyz and one viewing direction you have to run through the whole network to get these these values so these mlps these implicit representations can be quite slow your good old voxel representation on the other hand the explicit uh, representation basically would just store features on a grid on a regular grid for example in 3d and a voxel grid you know, 5D gets a little bit harder to store all of this in memory, but for 2D images, 3D scenes, 1D signals, this actually works pretty well. And it's actually the common practice today. Uh, these explicit representations can be queried very fast because you just run a bilinear or some other type of an interpolation. You do a lookup and you immediately have the value. You don't have to evaluate a full neural network, but these are very memory inefficient. So when we think about really good neural scene representations, they should have both of these uh, quantities. They should be fast and memory efficient. And this is what we can achieve with uh, hybrid representations, hybrid implicit explicit representations. So these would use some kind of a combination of direct uh, feature grid stored in a memory efficient way, potentially combined with a small MLP that basically acts as a nonlinear interpolation step. Uh, and that could also be uh, concatenated with the view direction here to uh, allow for fast and memory efficient uh, representation of complex scenes. So this, these types of hybrid representations have been used in uh, very recent papers and they're probably the future. So let me talk a little bit more about these hybrid representations. This is something that we have been exploring as well in our lab. Um, for example, in a SIGGRAPH paper last year, what we thought about is, okay, what if you have like a very high resolution image or maybe even a gigapixel image well uh, we need to think about this in a way that uh, you know there's some multi-scale information actually in the scene that we may want to exploit in order to do that uh, so for example in some regions of this image of pluto uh, we have you know not that much detail whereas in others we have a lot of detail so couldn't we sort of exploit that and it's easy to do this with quad trees or oak trees or other data structures for explicit uh, representations, but not as straightforward to use similar concepts with these neural network parameterized functions. So uh, we looked into this uh, and uh, called this adaptive coordinate networks uh, or ACORN. And the basic idea was that we take a relatively high resolution signal and during training, we learn a adaptive representation that adaptively allocates different resolution to different areas of the grid. And the nice thing about this is that you get a very high quality, first of all, uh, but in very little time. So for example, here we see that in about 30 seconds training time, we were able to fit, fit the 16 megapixel image uh, to a PSNR that is larger than 30 dBs. Now, I have to say that the sirens also converge to very high quality if you run them long enough. But uh, this is something that you probably don't necessarily want to wait for. So it's interesting to think about not just you know, optimizing an MLP first and then sort of bake it into some multi-scale representation, but to think about how to train it in a way that doesn't have to be fully trained first and then decomposed, but that sort of learns the decomposition along the way. And this is what ACORN does. Uh, here we can see a few examples of 3D shapes. Uh, these are pretty good high polygon count uh, 3D shapes that are fitted by uh, a convolutional occupancy networks, which was a recent uh, technique that, that has gained a lot of popularity, a conventional siren, uh, and also this ACON framework. And you can see that you get a lot more details after convergence, although the siren does work pretty well. Uh, a multi-scale representation is always uh, interesting and uh, adds potentially more capacity to the network. So in summary, just a few thoughts on these neural scene representations. They have become very popular, probably most, uh, mostly popularized by NERF, uh, but we don't necessarily need to think about neural scene representations as black box neural networks that you know, can be queried at any coordinate and give you some, some value. We can think about these as mixtures between uh, feature grids that are probably more intuitive, uh, or hybrid representations of that uh, sort of mix these feature representations with MLPs in a meaningful and interpretable manner. But when you think about a neural scene representation, it has to satisfy a couple of uh, properties. 
they need to be fast to query. Otherwise, it's just going to be very slow. Uh, they have to be very expressive. And what that means is the network has to have quite a bit of capacity to be able to represent the scene, uh, especially complicated scenes. And they have to also be memory efficient at the same time. So achieving all of these three aspects simultaneously is not always straightforward. But the, these emerging hybrid representations allow you to do that. Uh, Multi-scale capabilities would be nice to have because it adds interpretability and allows you to optimize things in a course of fine manner or, and enables many other things. But if you use a black box MLP, there's no way you can necessarily represent multiple different scales separately. So an alternative to MLPs or actually different architecture that's called multiplicative filter networks or MFNs, uh, for example, like a paper that we called Bacon, which was just presented at CVPR uh, recently. And these are interesting and emerging alternatives to MLPs that inherently support multi-scale representation. So if you're interested in these you know, uh, neural network architectures for representing scenes, um, then it's not just always about MLPs. You can think about many different types of architectures that mix explicit representations or even totally different types of network architectures like these multiplicative networks. Uh, and, and these are really interesting directions. Now, to get the most out of, out of these types of representations, as, at least in a computer graphics and computer vision context, we need to think about differentiable rendering uh, that needs to go on top of that because typically we want to optimize these 3D representations or higher dimensional representations from 2D images. So to connect the, the representation to the form of supervision uh, in the form of images, we need some kind of a differentiable approach to rendering. And that's what I'll talk next uh, about. Uh, another aspect that you need to think about is now that we have a functional representation of a scene, a natural question to ask is, can we sort of generalize across multiple different scenes by thinking about them as distributions of functions? So each MLP is a function uh, or function approximator. And if you have a collection of you know, rooms, a collection of 3D shapes of people's bodies or heads or some other type of an object, they share a lot of similarities. So there's got to be some type of redundancy between looking at all the chairs in the world uh, it, that helps us you know, distill and generalize, distill our single representation that models this entire distribution of functions. So this is something unique that we can do with the neural scene representations, which I'll talk about after the next uh, uh, part. Let's talk about a little bit about rendering. This is a topic that you may be familiar with. So rendering is a complicated topic, has been a hot topic of research for many decades, obviously. And in the context of neural rendering, we typically think about two different uh, approaches, uh, depending on the choice of scene representation. So people oftentimes either think about you know, sphere tracing, if you are uh, rendering out a sine distance function, for example. So if your representation represents an SDF, you know, the natural way to render that is using sphere tracing. This was uh, published by uh, Hart in 96 already and has become sort of differentiable over the last few years, but it's the same idea. Uh, if you have a, new, a neural volume representation, you probably want to go with volume rendering. And this was also explored in the computer graphics community a long time ago. Nelson Max published their seminal paper in 1995. And these same techniques are now used in NERF and, and many other approaches. So uh, you can find a state-of-the-art report with a lot of details on these different types of rendering uh, techniques by Ayush uh, Tewari. Uh, I think the, the very recent one that went on archive in 21 and that was just recently published as part of a, a Eurographics 2022 is really a comprehensive review of these uh, rendering techniques. So I don't wanna spend too much time on this. Uh, just a few thoughts on uh, sphere tracing, for example, sphere tracing, you start a long array at some random position and you query the underlying SDF to understand how far away the closest surface is. And you go uh, march along the array for that amount of distance until you hit a surface. Now, surface rendering is great because once you've optimized a, uh, a, the surface from a collection of images without any depth information, you can actually 
extract the surface and render it using uh, conventional computer graphics techniques, for example, in real time. Uh, so there is a lot of benefit of you know, combining traditional computer graphics methods for rendering uh, with these in neural rendering enabled uh, inverse methods where you basically just take a couple of images and you optimize the surface and the, the appearance or maybe like the BRDF. And so uh, we looked into this as well in, in a paper that we called neural lumigraph rendering, which was the state of the art until uh, very recently where we can take a set of images of a person here, one of my former students, Lars, uh, and using traditional methods uh, like structure for motion, uh, for example, implementing call map gives you a pretty good result. This is sort of your traditional point cloud re representation, but it has a lot of holes and where it couldn't match features, uh, gives you some artifacts. Uh, IDR was a technique that was also published earlier last year. Uh, but the appearance is sort of blurry because the capacity of the networks used for the uh, for the uh, appearance wasn't really high enough. And combining uh, neural scene representations, in this case, a surface and SDF uh, with these siren-based uh, uh, network architectures for both the shape and the appearance allows us to extract a high-quality surface with all the details in the, in the appearance that uh, looks quite nice. And just applying this on a couple of older data sets from, from the light stage shows you that uh, for very sparse view input. So when you only have a few views, uh, neural volumes and NERF, uh, a couple of uh, earlier uh, neural rendering methods don't actually work all that well. They work really well when you have very dense supervision with lots of dense views, but these fear tracing results actually work pretty well or much better for sparser views, uh, simply because they use the surface uh, to regularize the reconstruction. But IDR loses a lot of the detail, whereas our neural looming graph rendering approach uh, gets a lot more detail back. So I don't want to say much more to uh, sphere tracing. Um, it, this is an interesting uh, technique that continues to develop, but most of the attention right now is actually on volume rendering or neural volume rendering. And neural volume rendering is not that difficult. Uh, you basically have a scene that represents color and opacity and you define a camera somewhere in space and shoot a bunch of rays through, through these scenes. Now, the goal for neural volume rendering is to uh, approximate an integral along this ray. So in order to do that, we're gonna take many, many, many different samples along each of the rays uh, and then approximate the integral. So this is a common technique, but it's very slow uh, because you have to evaluate the underlying scene representation for every sample you take along the ray. So again, if you have a, a HD a 1080p image, you know, you're going to have millions of different rays per uh, image, and you have to sample literally hundreds of thousands of times along each ray uh, and run a full feed forward pass for each of these samples. So you can imagine that this is pretty slow. One thing that we've been thinking about is, you know, can we automate this process somehow? There is automatic differentiation that you may be very familiar with. So all of machine learning is based on automatic differentiation. You define your network architecture. You run a feed forward pass through the network. You use auto diff to keep track of the gradients. And then you use gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, or uh, some atom solver to uh, update the parameters of the network using the chain rule. So automatic differentiation is easy. You can implement this in tools like TensorFlow and PyTorch because all you need is really the chain rule. And it's pretty much straightforward. So isn't there some way of doing the same thing for integration? Because if we could do that, then we wouldn't have to use all these inefficient sampling techniques to keep track of, uh, of, the, of the integral. Well, so this was sort of what we started out thinking about. Um, but thinking about this more, and this is a comic by XKCD, by the way. Uh, well, integration is a lot harder, especially doing it automatically, because there are so many different rules for so many different cases, whether it's Cauchy's formula, the Rich algorithm, or Riemann integration. Like there's so many different cases. It's, it's very challenging to write a software tool that will keep track of your integrals in a closed form solution. And that's why it's simply not done today. Uh, numerical integration techniques remain the most popular approaches, and there's a few different ways to think about this. 
but in general, you're just going to sample your function many times and approximate the integral in between from these samples. So the inefficient part about this is the number of times you need to sample, okay? So an idea that we came up with, which we called auto-int uh, for automatic integration was to you know, build on the fundamental theorem of calculus. And this is a pretty straightforward rule that you may remember from high school. Uh, it basically just says that for a function psi that you may want to integrate, uh, there is an antiderivative, which is a functional form of its undefinite integral. So on the top, you can see that phi is the antiderivative, and it, it basically represents the undefined integral of the function of interest psi in this case. Now, if you have the integral, the antiderivative of your function that you want to integrate, then you can evaluate any definite integral um, with just two evaluations of that antiderivative. So uh, that's the Newton Leibniz formula that you can see on the bottom. So if, if there's a way to find the antiderivative of your uh, neural scene representation, then you can efficiently calculate any integral with just two evaluations instead of hundreds or thousands. And trying to automate this was the idea behind AutoInt. And what we did here is um, we, instead of specifying the function that represents the density and the color of the scene, so the, the volume, if you want, we actually uh, define an MLP that represents the antiderivative of that function. So the, the MLP represents uh, uh, phi in this case. We can use automatic differentiation. We actually wrote a little compiler that calculates the graph of the derivative of this anti of this function, the, uh, the, that psi, this is the grad network basically. And there's a closed form solution to go from the uh, MLP to its derivative. Uh, the nice thing about this is that it uses the exact same weights just in a different configuration. So the weights aren't any different, they're just resorted in a different graph structure. And what that allows us to do is we can now take this grad network train that using NERF or any other volume rendering techniques, and then automatically recompile and reassemble the optimized weights of this you know, non-standard MLP-based representation and reassemble them into the integral network. And what that means is that once we train the grad network using standard volume rendering techniques uh, or standard techniques, we can actually evaluate the antiderivative very, very efficiently. And we don't have to re-optimize anything because all the parameters are already there. So this was a really interesting approach. Uh, it works pretty well. Uh, it's fairly fast also. Here's a hot dog scene uh, from the original NERF paper. So the quality sort of matches what you'd get with NERF and neural volumes. Um, the, the challenge here is that uh, volume rendering is actually two nested integrals, which makes it a little bit more challenging. So this technique, AutoInt, is really well suited for individual integrals. But as soon as you have nested integrals, uh, the two uh, evaluations of the of the antiderivative are actually not true anymore. You kind of have to evaluate it in sections, which makes it a little bit less efficient. But uh, I think that was a really clever idea that uh, pushed this uh, field in a slightly different direction and hopefully provides some good food for thought. So a couple of thoughts on neural rendering. The two properties that seem to be most important here are computational efficiency, because you want it to work fast, obviously, uh, and then also the gradient flow. Gradient flow is very, very important, uh, and this works actually really well for volume rendering, because you're sampling this volume everywhere in space all the time, so the gradients actually flow back into all these different samples. If you use something like sphere tracing and you don't hit a surface with a ray, there's no gradients flowing back into the representation. So sphere tracing is actually a lot more difficult to get good gradient flow into the underlying representation because you have to hit the surface. It depends a lot on the initialization. And if you don't hit the surface, then there's no gradient flow going back. So this has been a challenge, although uh, a really nice paper that was just published at SIGGRAPH 2022 uh, from Wenzel Jakob's group showed how to actually make uh, sphere tracing results uh, much better and more robust using really good gradient flow. So there's some recent activities in, uh, in this area that makes sphere tracing probably a lot more robust. So the efficiency here is 
not just the efficiency of the of the neural rendering, but it is also the, the time that it takes to query the underlying representation. Because as I mentioned, that every time you query the every time you sample a long ray for volume rendering, you have to run a full feed forward pass through the underlying network to get the value that you want. And being able to do that fast, you know, defines the overall time. So it, it boils back down to the efficiency of the representation, which is the point I was trying to do earlier. Okay, so now the question is, what's more important? Is it the representation or is it the rendering, for example? So uh, the original NERF paper suggested that the representation is actually the, the most important thing. And that is true to some extent. Uh, but a couple of recent papers, for example, Alex Yu's paper called Planoxils actually render, demonstrated that it's really the volume rendering that's the key for uh, NERF to work so well. Uh, and, uh, but, and you can actually train it much faster using more traditional um, uh, volume feature volume representations. So what that means is that the rendering step is very important. And typically we use something that is a physics-based rendering step. Uh, this acts as an inductive bias in the entire network or, or in the entire differential pipeline that forces the representation to learn something physically meaningful. So the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, people in computer graphics typically think about physically interpretable things and they're shying away from black box neural networks In machine learning, people just jump at these black box neural networks. But I think neural rendering or neural scene representation and rendering together can overcome that by combining the best of both worlds. You can use your physical based rendering as long as it's differentiable along with a underlying representation that has enough capacity to represent the scene uh, and the rendering step itself will act as a regularizer to make sure that whatever it does optimize is actually physically interpretable. Okay, so here are a couple of open problems uh, and things that people are working on right now. I mean, uh, you know, maybe a year ago, I would have said, you know, training a NERF or neural scene representation is probably the most important problem or inference or rendering speed as well. Although there's been some great progress recently that I'll show you in the next slide, but we still need to scale these tools up to the same uh, scale that uh, you know we know traditional computer graphics tools to work well at. Uh, generalization is a big thing, being able to learn something from objects from by looking at other objects of the same class. And then editability is something that's not as straightforward with these types of neural scene representations. So as I was saying, just in the last couple of months, we've seen a lot of progress in this, uh, both the scalability and also the uh, optimization and inference time. For example, the instant NGP paper from NVIDIA uh, that you can see on the right demonstrated real-time rendering for nerfs. And they also trained these nerfs in just a few seconds using hash tables. So that, again, these are data structures that have been explored in the computer graphics community for a while. And by combining the best of these traditional techniques with these emerging neural rendering and representation techniques, we're able to do these amazing NERF optimizations in just a few seconds. So that, that was very impressive. And then on the left, you can see a fly through, uh, through parts of uh, this Lombard Street in San Francisco, a couple of city blocks here. So they have these Waymo cars driving around San Francisco everywhere, and they collect a lot of data. So uh, Matt Tanchik from uh, Berkeley did an internship at Waymo, and he used all of this data from a couple of city blocks to think about how to fuse all this data into a couple of nerfs that represent actually a few blocks of a whole city. So people are definitely making a lot of progress towards expanding the scale of these types of nerfs, and that's a really great direction. And these are some impressive initial results. Okay, so, so far, you know, uh, maybe I've convinced you that uh, these neural scene representations may be interesting. You can combine them with traditional rendering techniques, uh, given that you make sure that they're differentiable and uh, you know the gradients flow back. So that's good. But let me show you a few things that you just can't do with traditional uh, uh, with traditional graphics techniques as easily. And so for me, this is the pinnacle of you know machine learning based uh, computer graphics. And these are generative adversarial networks or generative models in general. So I'll mostly talk about now a recent paper that we just presented at CVPR, which we called Efficient Geometry Aware 3D Generative Adversarial Networks. So the basic idea is that you train a network to generate people or animals that you've never seen before. These people do not exist in reality. They're not reconstructed in any way. 
They're completely synthetically generated, but they look photorealistic. And more importantly, they are 3D in the sense that you can you know, define the camera to any perspective and they're multi-view consistent, at least as best as possible. And maybe you even have some underlying understanding of the shape of the scene, but this would come for free. So how do we get to the point where we can generate photorealistic high resolution images that are multi-view consistent? Well, first we need a, we need a training data set uh, to train these models. Any computer, uh, any machine learning technique has to be trained somehow. And there are a few uh, interesting there are a few interesting data sets here. For example, there are data sets that are captured in a studio in a light stage. Uh, for example, one of these is triple gangers, for example, where you have a bunch of people wearing uh, shower masks and you know we have multiple cameras that are calibrated, capturing them at high resolution. So we can have ground truth shape from you know photogrammetry. Uh, maybe we even have changing illumination conditions. These are really great studio data sets that are high quality, but it's very difficult and costly to capture these types of data sets. And typically we don't actually have that much different data. On the other hand, we have synthetic data sets, uh, like for example, Microsoft has a, has a, has a data set on, uh, online that has synthetic people there, you know, close to photorealistic, but not quite. The nice thing about this data set is that we have ground truth depth, we have semantic labels, we have perfect camera poses, we have all the, uh, all, all the annotations that we may want. And we have a lot of them. We have 100,000 identities here. So this is like orders of magnitude more. Um, neither of these are ideal because we want to learn photorealistic data. So synthetic data may not be able to cut it. And the studio capture data isn't diverse enough to really let us learn anything and not even speaking of hair. So ideal case scenario is that we take large data sets with lots of identities that are totally unstructured and just scraped from the internet. And one such data set is FFHQ, the Flickr uh, face data set that was uh, assembled by NVIDIA a couple of years ago. And so these are high resolution views of maybe 70,000 different people, uh, lots of diversity in this data. They're also nicely cropped, but there are no real annotations to them. So they're unstructured. And the more difficult part is that they only have a single view of any one identity. So you don't get multi-view supervision. The question then is like, can we use this unstructured single view data set to learn a 3D or learn how to generate 3D multi-view consistent representations? I mean, the answer is yes, but uh, it seems interesting and not straightforward how to get there. In order to do this, we need to leverage GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. And GANs are uh, at the most basic form in 2D, a two component system. You have a generator and a discriminator. The generator takes as input a random noise vector and it generates an image that it thinks came from a certain distribution. The discriminator will then look at this image <clears throat> and tell you if it's actually real or fake. And it does that by comparing this image to the data set of images and it's trying to decide whether it came from the distribution of pixel values in the training data. So generator and discriminator are trained together um, and this works really well for 2D and has been working uh, incredibly well for the last few years. For example, StyleGAN from NVIDIA is the state of the art in this case. But it's not straightforward to do this in 3D. <clears throat> People have tried it uh, in different ways, but you can't just generate a 3D voxel grid because it's too inefficient and memory inefficient. So what you ideally want to do is use a efficient generator, a 2D discriminator, and then create a 3D scene and render it from multiple different perspectives and <clears throat> feed all of these different images into the discriminator and make sure that all of the different perspectives rendered of the same generated scene all look like natural images. So this doesn't necessarily guarantee multi-view consistency, but it it makes sure that all these views look correct. And it'll just turn out that when trained with an adversarial loss, this approach works pretty well, okay? So we're gonna use a generator to generate some type of a neural scene representation. We render it from a few different perspectives, just a few. And then we feed all of these into the discriminator, making sure that all of them look real. 
there's a couple of key messages here. The discriminator operates on 2D images. We don't need 3D data. And that's important because that's the only way we can use existing you know, single view data sets to train this, so, such as FFHQ. Uh, we can render a single view or multiple views, but even if we render multiple views, there's no multi-view consistency loss or anything like that. They're all just independently fed into the discriminator and independently processed. So this is really important because otherwise we need multi-view supervision. And again, that's challenging to get good data sets. Uh, what's challenging here is that uh, <laughs> we need to render full resolution images during training. So those uh, we need to be able to render it fast. Uh, but we don't just need to train render one image. We need to render millions of images in order to train the GAN. So let's take a step back to really make sure that we understand what that means. So if you want to render a neural scene representation, like a NERF, you only need to render it once to generate an image. And that already takes a couple of minutes for the original NERF, and we got this down to seconds or so in recent work. If you want to optimize a NERF, you need to render the representation you know, maybe a few thousand times and backpropagate the error using uh, error backpropagation to train the NERF. So you know, rendering a single scene a few thousand times takes a while, and the original NERF took a day to do that, right? If you want to train again, you need to not only do this once or a few thousand of times, you need to do this tens of millions of times in order to train the GAN. So the single most important aspect of a GAN is therefore that the neural rendering is computationally uh, very efficient. So you know, existing neural rendering techniques are just too slow to train a 3D GAN. It's just not possible to do it. So in our CVPR paper, we came up with a really different and very efficient representation. And again, the focus here was not on being really clever about, you know, uh, making uh, making sure that this is uh, is captures the 3D geometry in all its nuances. It was really trying to brute force uh, the efficiency here. And what we did is something stupidly simple is we came up with what we call a triplane representation where we take three 2D planes that are axis aligned on the X, Y, uh, X, Z, and Y, Z plane. And these three planes have features uh, at every point. We can now query any 3D position in 3D space by projecting that coordinate onto the three planes, extracting the features, for example, using bilinear uh, interpolation, and then aggregating these three features together to get a single 3D feature. And again, we used the simplest thing that we can come up with, which is just summing those features together as the aggregation function. We tried other aggregation functions too. None worked better or more robustly in multiple cases than the simple sum. So you just take these three features from the three planes, you sum them together, and then we have a very, very lightweight implicit decoder. And what that means is it's a two-layer MLP that takes this 3D feature as input and that outputs density and color. And then we put a nerf style neural volume rendering step on top of this. There's no view dependency in this case, uh, but what the nice thing about this is that the memory is very efficient. It scales quadratically versus cubically because you don't have a volume of features. You just have features on these three planes. It turns out that this is easy to generalize. And perhaps the most important thing is that it's totally compatible with off the shelf 2D generator architectures. So we can use existing StyleGAN type generators to generate these three planes because they're just 2D images. And to convince you that this simple representation actually works, we have a full state-of-the-art mip nerf representation, fully implicit on the left, representing a scene from the tanks and temples data set. And on the right, we just fit these, this triplane representation uh, to the same scene. We can render it eight times faster. Uh, the details are better. We don't get view-dependent effects, but they don't seem to matter in this case much. Uh, and there are some slight hacks that you can do to get the view-dependent effects on the right too. So this is a single scene overfitting scenario where we just take one scene and we fit this triplane representation to it. Works really well. We can interpolate just the same as we can with MIP nerve. Now, putting this all together into a 3D GAN pipeline allows us to train uh, this in a, in a GAN setting. And in this case, we have a couple of different components. We have our triplane representation. 
an annual volume rendering step on top of that. So there's nothing really new. I already told you about these three planes and the volume rendering, uh, but we have this generator. And the generator is basically an off-the-shelf StyleGAN 2 generator. So these are architectures that have been developed for 2D image generation before. And the nice thing is that we just output you know, a bunch of features in a 2D image and we chop them up into features that we then spatially align in all three dimensions to get the triplane representation. So this is probably the most important thing is we can use this really well understood and well explored StyleGAN 2 generator architecture to generate the representation. We can also use a StyleGAN 2 discriminator uh, simply because uh, the output of our method are 2D images. Uh, there's a couple of other nuances in here, which include a super resolution module. So our raw neural rendered images are still 128 by 128 uh, with a bunch of additional features. And we're going to have a 2D CNN that super resolves those to 512 by 512 at the end of the day. And in order to do this in a multi-view consistent way so that it doesn't hallucinate any details that are not multi-view consistent, we add two things. We add camera post conditioning on the uh, generator and the discriminator. And we also add dual discrimination, which I'll show you in a second. So discrimination is typically done by generating an image such as the one on the right, and then drawing an image from the data set and then comparing these with your CNN to make sure that they're real and not fake. Dual discrimination means that you actually do this at multiple different scales. The first scale is the raw resolution of the neural rendering. And the second one is the super resolved, super uh, uh, high resolution image. So we feed both of these images in the raw rendered image, as well as the super resolved image from the generator. And then for the training data set, we take the image at the original resolution and, and a downsampled blurred image. And we compare both of these scales simultaneously. And that works really well. So here's a generated result from our method at the raw resolution of the neural renderer. And the super resolved image. So you can see that you get a lot more details for this super resolved image. Just want to draw your attention also to this dual discrimination, which is done on the right, works really well. And the post condition is something that you can maybe read up on the paper, but the basic idea is that there's a lot of bias in the data set itself in that people typically look towards the camera. They typically smile when they see the camera, but they don't otherwise. So there's a lot of you know, data set dependent biases in these photographs, and you need to sort of capture those when you train your GAN. And in order to do this, we train the GAN with uh, the generator and the discriminator knowing what the camera poses that they're rendered from, but during rendering, we disable the generator post conditioning uh, to make sure that we are more view consistent. Let me show you a couple of results. This is a generated person, doesn't exist. We can render this person from multiple different camera angles. Uh, the resolution is 512 by 512. We even get details in the glasses uh, and teeth. The hair obviously is also very interesting for all of these different people. So these are just different identities. Uh, because the data set is pretty diverse, we can actually get that diversity also in our generated results. Without being supervised on depth, we can sample the opacity that's learned and actually extract using uh, marching cubes the shapes that are generated, and they look reasonable. It's never supervised on the shape, but uh, this method actually does learn a scaffold uh, that helps with multi-view consistency. In this case, we didn't treat the background in any special way. So these are generated cats. It also works for 360 degree scenes like cars that we showed in the paper, but these are just faces and cats. And you even get a lot of diversity in these trained cats. So this is another FFH, FFAQ data set uh, that has all these different animals. So the results look really good. And if you compare them to state-of-the-art 3D GANs like giraffe, pie GAN, lifting style GAN, Ours really is a big step in the quality, especially on the shapes, because most existing high resolution 3D GANs uh, heavily rely on these super resolution modules that give you 
uh, results that look good from one perspective, but that, that are not multi-view consistent. Uh, we also, the same authors uh, actually wrote PyGAN just about a year ago. So, and from our recent work, PyGAN, to our newer work, EG3D, the, the, that we published this year, we were able to get the frame rate up from one frame per second to 30 frames per second. And the FID score, which measures the quality down to a level that is almost comparable to StyleGAN and 2D. So we're close to approaching the same image quality, image fidelity with 3D GANs that we have enjoyed for a few years now with 2D GANs as well. Uh, this is a result where we interpolate. Sorry, now the video is a little bit choppy. Yeah, I'm going to share this again. This is one of my favorite results, actually. So here we're interpolating the latent code between multiple different identities. And this is something that you just can't do with any traditional computer graphics or computer vision technique. Uh, you're basically just interpolating between these, these people by interpolating the latent code. Uh, and th this is done in a multi-view consistent way. We are showing the rendering of the appearance on the left and also the depth map on the right. So this is really unique to these GANs. It's like this latent code interpolation uh, that really demonstrates that all of these are completely sy synthetic people that don't exist at all and you can generate any identity continuously between two of them. Now, as I was saying, all of this runs in real time. So here we have a screen capture of our method run, running in real time. We can change the identity of the cats in this case. I use the mouse to just you know, change the camera perspective. Hopefully this convinces you that this actually does run in, in, in real time. We just released the, the pre-trained models and the code also on our website. So if you're interested in this general topic, you can check that out. You know, one interesting application is GAN inversion. GAN inversion means you take a photograph of a real person here on the left. The network is sort of randomly initialized, on, like you can see on the right. And now you can actually optimize the latent code representing the, this person to try to match the single view. So with a single image, you can fit a 3D representation of this person and render it from multiple different perspectives. And this person was not part of the training data, uh, like Lincoln here was not either. And, and this is really interesting because now you can take a photo of yourself, a portrait image, start fitting a 3D model to it and generate your personal avatar or use this in in other interesting ways. So the GAN inversion is a topic that uh, we've explored also recently a little bit more. Uh, for example, one thing you can do, and perhaps one of the killer apps is to you know, control your portrait image uh, and animate it. So uh, an application of 2D GANs that we've seen over the last couple of years is attribute editing. So you could take a single photograph of a person and change attributes like age, facial hair, uh, their hairstyle, their gender, or add glasses to them. So this is really incredible and works really well for 2D GANs, but wouldn't it be nice if we could also reanimate uh, this person, for example, using a driving video of somebody else. So this is something that is uniquely enabled by 3D GAN inversion at high quality. And in this case, we're gonna show you in a second how the single photo, the single source image of Adam Driver is then animated by the facial expressions and camera pose of the driving video that you can see on the lower left. And we can do that using the original source image or any of these edited images. And that allows us to generate close to photorealistic edits given a single image using these 3D GAN techniques. So this is an active area of research. The quality isn't quite photorealistic yet, but it's, it's slowly getting there. And again, without being ever supervised or anything like this, we can see the 3D shape of the single source image that is also being animated here. So again, this is something uniquely enabled by 3D GANs. Take a look at our archive paper uh, on controllable portrait image animation via 3D GAN inversion if you're interested in this general topic. One open question though is, uh, well, so far we've only seen cats and faces. What about you know, entire bodies, can we generate avatars? Um, well, if 
this is a little bit more challenging to do for 3D bodies. And this is because 3D bodies are much more diverse in terms of their articulation. So people have all sorts of different body poses, at least in rich data sets that show real people. They were accessories like handbags, clothes, uh, they ride bikes or other things. It's really challenging to get a nice data set of even just 2D photographs of people that is well aligned with one another, which is something that we rely on for this learning these phases. So it's also difficult to get clean data sets that actually have annotation of uh, the 3D joint or uh, joints or poses of these people. So while we don't need the exact camera pose for each image or the body pose, we do need to know what the distribution is of the data set. And so having segmentation masks, having 3D joint or camera poses uh, really helps. Uh, and then also these data sets have a lot of self-occlusion. So that's uh, sometimes difficult or multiple people occluding each other. So it's much more challenging to do this for human bodies and we don't have really good data sets either. Uh, so this is something we've been looking at more recently uh, with a technique that we called GNARF, Generative Neural Articulated Radiance Fields. So here the idea is to use a similar generator that takes as input a latent code Z and generates a radiance field of a person. Uh, so Z in this case controls the identity. And what we did in this case is to generate the person in a canonical body pose that is then explicitly deformed uh, for example, using some kind of a driving mesh, for example, a simple mesh that you can see here. Uh, and this deformation module is really explicit. It's not trying to learn it. It's just taking the radiance field and deform it uh, using uh, recently explored techniques. And using that, you can generate people, uh, different types of people, and then animate them or reanimate them in any way you like. This is pretty interesting. Here you can see a driving mesh on the upper left. Uh, with multiple different identities that are all driven using this. Uh, so this is a first step towards, I would say, automatic avatar generation. Uh, and it, it'll be really interesting to see uh, where this may take us. Uh, it's actually very challenging to do this without the deformation module. If you just take you know, the EG3D baseline and train it on a, a data set of people, such as AIST++ in this case, and then you try to re -warp these generated people, it's actually challenging because they're generated in an arbitrary pose and you have to detect that pose first. Whereas our method does it in the canonical pose and then deforms it after. So uh, this paper is either already on archive or will be up there soon. And uh, this kind of concludes my talk. Uh, again, as I was saying, uh, my lab actually works on a couple of different techniques and neural rendering is one of them. We work on computational imaging, computational camera, single photon imaging, computational microscopy, lots of displays and other technology for VR and AR. So with this, I'd like to thank the EG3D co-authors, uh, which include folks from Stanford and also from NVIDIA. Uh, my student, Eric, did part of this work while he was at an internship at NVIDIA last summer. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, current and previous group members that uh, contributed massively to all the work that I showed you today. Thanks for your attention, and hopefully we have a couple of minutes for Q&A.